Thanks, Arthur. I've got one of these uh, <clears throat> mic things. Can you hear me okay at the back? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Jolly good? Okay. Well, uh, thanks for coming. I'm overwhelmed, almost as overwhelmed as Arthur, actually, by all the uh, wonderful names and old friends who've uh, come today. So thank you very much indeed for coming. I'm going to go straight on because the, the talk's in two parts, and the first uh, part is one hour, and I've got to show you 180 slides, so that is one slide every 20 seconds, so we, we, uh, we'll be taking it uh, uh, fairly quickly. And I want to actually go, I'm talking mainly about Ming Ming too, but I actually want to go right back to the beginning, because there is a kind of thread uh, that goes right back as far as this boat is going, and I want to try and trace that thread right from the very beginning and it probably starts there <laughs> when i was 10 years old i was probably thinking about well i was definitely thinking about crossing oceans in small boats um by the time i was 21 um i had my own boat this was sailing on the swan river in uh, in perth western australia it was just a half decked uh, racing boat um but i wanted to go to sea so i did go to sea and this is my first proper seagoing experience in this uh, square egg ship. And for a young guy, it was absolutely fantastic to, to be a, um, a full-time able seaman on this sort of boat, learn my uh, proper Marlin Spike seamanship and so on. Beautiful, beautiful uh, boat, 200 tons and all the rest of it. Uh, 98 feet on deck, 138 feet overall. And of course, it was really, really hard work being a, um, <laughs> a, a sailor on a, on a squaring ship. Um, and it was idyllic until that. And that's the boat uh, photograph taken on the shore, um, driven onto a sand bank off the northeast coast of New Zealand in a tropical storm. Uh, and we had the pleasant experience of having to go overboard abandoned ship effectively uh, into those uh, breaking seas which meant a long drift to the beach um, but we made it all of the crew survived the boat didn't and the reason I mention this is because it's a really formative experience to to discover that you know big well crewed ships are not necessarily um, the safest things to be on, but more importantly, relying on other people's seamanship is not necessarily the best way to go. Um, so it was, it was that experience that really led to the idea of sailing my own boats, small, easily managed, um, strong, single-handed, so I had no uh, responsibility for other people and nobody else was relying on me. So it became, from that moment, a very, very pure um, sort of concept. So within a few months off I was uh, putting this into practice, building my first um, little ocean cruiser. And I didn't have any money, I'd been washed on the beach, uh, literally, washed up with nothing. Um, and in those days, ferrous cement was fairly um, uh, advanced in New Zealand and it was uh, a very cheap way of building a boat, labour intensive but cheap. Um, so I built this boat and uh, by the way, you can get a decent finish on ferrous cement if you really try. Yeah. <laughs> throw, throw that in. Um, however, as far as this boat was concerned, um, I got some things right and I got some things wrong, probably in about 50-50. About you see here there's no cockpit, and I was already thinking at that stage about having a completely integrated hull, extra strength, more space below, and so on and so forth. Um, <coughs> I had already, even at that stage, they didn't like the idea of washboards. So even in 1972, when I was building this, um, I made the after end of the cabin in, in solid mahogany, um, which is something I've always continued with. So this is a nice little boat, very strongly built. Um, one thing, in my view, which I did wrong was, because uh, it's only a very, very small boat, built for ocean going, was to have a sliding hatch. And you'll see that I built very complex bat baffles in the mistaken idea that it might actually, um, you know, keep water out if I was uh, 
turn turtle or anything. Well, I was turned turtle and it didn't keep the water out. It's amazing how much water will come through. Um, but that's all part of life's great learning experiences. I did build sort of cockpit combings, uh, which were useful, but there was no actual cockpit. Although later on I did actually put in a little footwell. I'll talk more about cockpits uh, as we go. But inside, you can see that was a boat built by somebody who had just been um, uh, wrecked in a serious way and seen the power of the sea firsthand. Uh, everything very, very strong, laminated beams, extreme curvature, everything, all the carlins through bolted, corner post through bolted, etc., etc. So it was an extremely strong boat, and just as well because it went through many uh, storms, particularly in the, in the Tasman Sea. All the deck beams are uh, laminated. But I did things wrong as well. I followed the design a little bit too slavishly, but it was my first boat. I didn't know much about it. I now wouldn't have had all that sort of space like that. Uh, no watertight bulkheads. And my other big thing, as most of you know, will have it, is having an unsinkable boat. And I didn't even think of it at that point. And anyway, even if I had, uh, it was a very, very heavy boat, and it probably would have just been too much of a, would have taken too much of the interior of the boat to, um, to have made it um, unsinkable. Uh, in my view, for a little boat, again, this was a mistake. This came off an old caravan, you know, having all these uh, nice appointments, which I find I actually don't need when I'm at sea at all. All that weight, I would have been much better to have had an another bunk on that side. Um, Anyway, she was a good boat. That's uh, just show another little archive photograph. That's uh, the very, very first sail in the Haraki Gulf. So I'm looking pretty pleased uh, with it. Um, as you can see, she was a, uh, a sloop, but even then everything was kind of belt and braces, twin four stays, so as I could keep headsails permanently hanged on, running up and down. This was in the days before furling headsails, um, fortunately and uh, twin backstays. But, as you see here, we've got this fellow on board. I didn't have time to talk about the, the wreck of the Endeavour 2, the square rigger, but we had one of these fail on us. So I lost all um, uh, reliance on life rafts at a very early age. And uh, again, this boat was wrong from my perspective now, in that I did have a life raft. Um, but I've taken the view, as I'll come on to later, that um, it's probably better to make your boat your, uh, itself your lifeboat. That, that's my sort of uh, philosophy, rather than having a little flimsy rubber thing that may or may not um, work um, as your <coughs> sort of uh, last resort. Uh, she was sloop rig, but I could actually, she had roller reefing. Um, Sort of getting there in the sense that I, I could actually reach the roller reefing from the hatch. I could do a lot of stuff from the hatch, but I still had to come forward to mess about with with um, head saws and, and so on. So just show this, uh, that's the start of the 1974 transatlantic race. And I show this for local sailors because you might recognize what this is. I know we've got an ex-owner, at least one here, T24. Yeah, there you go, which actually won the race. So how about that? Sailed by an Englishman, who's, uh, Bill Belcher, who'd sailed it out to, to New Zealand. Um, however, we did get to Australia, uh, which was fine. She was a wonderful little boat, as, um, don't get me wrong. She wasn't, she was by no means perfect, but I did many, many thousands of miles in it. Um, but the first crossing was interesting. We had lots of, uh, lots of damage there. Um, but I, I was pleased to get there, a nice smile and a nice beer. So that was the that was the first boat a long time ago and yeah I reckon I think I had a ferry yeah there she is. That's the last photograph of oh was that me making the noise? Yeah. Ow. I was wondering who was making that noise. <laughs> now I know what it is it's my hand. The, is the, the reserve wire going into the box? It probably just sounds like it sounds it? like something's it's probably me bashing my hand. Well if you take it out of just replug it in. Think it's going take into it the box now. We need to replug it. Excuse me. Oh, a slight technical picture. <laughs> 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 
I'll just hold it, and then I can't bash my hand. Sea water. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was very proud of that bed. I was only 23 when I started building it, and I knew nothing really about boat building, or not a lot. I kind of made it up as I went along, and she was, she was a good little boat. Um, but I learned a lot from the things which I did wrong, as far as that boat was concerned. And now we have to fast forward uh, very quickly. There were other boats uh, in the meantime, but not small ocean going boats. You know, when you're uh, raising a family, building a business and all the rest of it, we had to lay that aside. But um, what brought me back to it was the Jester Challenge. I'm delighted that my good friend Trevor, owner of Jester, is here today. That was taken at the start of the 2008 Jester Azores Challenge. That's off Rainhead. <coughs> um, and of course I've been aware of Jester for, for decades and have been really interested in the junk rig because um, part of my idea was trying to get an easily handled um, boat, an easily handled rig. Um, and Jester had that and a lot, I, I think the attraction for me was the whole concept of easy sailing. Why should one, why does one want to make sailing more difficult than it needs to be. That's what I can't understand. Why wouldn't you make it as easy as possible so that you're relaxed, um, uh, well rested, and therefore you make better seaman-like decisions? Um, so my idea was largely to, to see how this could be developed in a sense. I think Blondo, from what I've read, he actually wanted the Ostars to be a, a testing ground for this sort of boat. Because what happened was it became a big commercial thing, for uh, very commercially driven. Uh, but Blondo was interested in the ordinary man um, who could just sail uh, uh, boats within their reach, within their budget, um, and sail them safely and easily. So that's, that's what that boat is about. So when I wanted to uh, join the Jester Challenge, I had to find a boat very quickly. So here she is, and inevitably she is a junk rig, little um, uh, <coughs> Bill's Keel Corby. However, I would not advise uh, anybody to go to sea in a Bill's Keel Corby or any sort of Corby without serious um, you know, rebuilding. So now I was able to start to put some of the ideas which have been fermenting for a long time uh, into practice. And the first of these was to make the boat um, unsinkable. So uh, four and a half foam filled and watertight bulkheads. I can tell you, I've been in many storms in the North Atlantic and it's a much nicer feeling being in an unsinkable boat than a sinkable boat. Um, yeah, because fundamentally there are two places you can be, either on the top, communing with the seabirds and the air, or at the bottom, communing with deep sea you know, creatures, and I know where I'd rather be. So, um, also, strengthening the boat, uh, putting an extra bridge deck in, both for transverse strength, um, additional buoyancy, uh, and, and stowage. But here we are again, we come back to the idea of the, uh, the solid um, after the cabin again. This was actually almost identical inch and a quarter mahogany that we made that in. But then we come to the big change, which was not having a sliding hatch. And again, I can assure you, in very heavy weather, it is very um, comforting to be able to just um, close the hatches and dog everything down and know that not a drop of water can get in that boat, whatever happens. So that combined with unsinkability it, um, is a big antidote to, to um, uh, tension and worry and all that sort of stuff, which can undermine decision making. That's the point of it. Also making the cockpit smaller um, by putting another watertight um, um, compartment in the cockpit. Uh, the whole aft, after part is also foam filled and sealed. And I do like boats when I, I prefer boats that actually don't have a, a, cockpit, a, tra a cockpit that goes right to the transom. I like to have an after compartment because then you can fill it with foam, make it very buoyant, and then in following seas you've got that additional buoyancy. Also, it means if you do get green water, that it's it's in board. Now this cockpit has been filled with green water scores and scores and scores of times, and it doesn't matter because it's it's fairly central to the boat. It doesn't affect it at all. It just drains out, and that's the end of it. It doesn't drag the stern down, and I think that's important. <coughs> Um, now we're moving on a little bit after the first voyage's development. Um, 
building uh, combings around the, uh, the hatch. And just remember this when we come to Ming Ming Tu, uh, because Ming Ming Tu has a different arrangement uh, quite deliberately, but built the, the spray hood. And that was a boat that could be managed from the central hatch very easily by means of having uh, um, long distance uh, regulator for the self steering. Also, because I started doing Arctic sailing, I got very um, interested in um, uh, insulating the boats. And uh, there's a bit of insulation on the table. I brought some, some aids here. So there's some insulation to show you uh, on that table there. But the insulation also adds to buoyancy. Um, but for Arctic sailing, where water temperatures are perhaps uh, you know, zero, one degrees, it certainly helps to have an insulated boat. So that was uh, uh, Ming Ming, and you see she's got the um, uh, head saw, which is another thing I've done away with. Uh, she's got a typical flat cut uh, junk sail, which was not very powerful or hard on the wind, so I needed a head saw. It's just a bloody nuisance, frankly. Um, it's the only thing that caused me um, uh, sort of upset the harmony of the boat. You have to get out and go forward to gasket it or ungasket it. So I've done away with that on the, on the new boat. Um, having a different no rig, really. Anyway, she was a good boat. We went to Yan Mayan. We went to the ice to the east of Greenland. Uh, we went to Iceland. That's the northwest fields. Uh, we went to the Azores. Uh, we went to the west of Greenland, into the Davis Strait. Um, we went to Spitsbergen. We went to 80 degrees north. Um, so she did about 20,000 miles. And that's my, one of my favourite photographs. That's after the West Greenland voyage at Queen Anne Battery. And that was Ming Ming more or less in her finished state. And I view boats as more or less living sculptures. They're never finished. It's always working away at them. And that was, that was in a very, very advanced state with all the, all the governments, um sweeps and skulls and all the rest of it. So why should I want to build another boat? Um, well, she was getting tired, actually. And the Corabi is not very strongly built, actually. You know, and I really did look after it at sea. Um, but the main thing is, I, the, the further north I was sailing, the lighter the winds were getting, as it is. And, so, and I just love it up there. So I wanted a, uh, a boat which would be really good for light weather sailing in the high pressure systems of the, <coughs> of the high Arctic. So first of all, I had to find an appropriate um, design. And after a lot of study and searching, I decided that the Achilles 24, designed by Oliver Lee, local man, um, relative of the squib, very slippery boat, uh, uh, light displacement, because um, that's one thing I got wrong with the first boat, was displacement a bit too heavy. Um, and the nearest thing I could get to a slightly scaled up um, Corby. I didn't want much, I didn't need any more room inside, but I felt I would just be nice to have about three more feet on the waterline, which this boat gave me. But then, of course, I had to re-rig it as a junk rig, and this had never been done before on Achilles. So I had to do the drawings. Uh, so here I have to calculate the center of lateral resistance of the underwater plane. That's the uh, center of effort of the Bermudan rig. The junk rig puts it a lot higher, but this doesn't bother me too much because the junk rig can be reefed so easily. And this is the great joy that I can reef it literally with one hand in two seconds, any size of sail uh, that I want. Um, trouble here is there's no hard and fast rules about where, where exactly the, how far forward the sense of effort should be from the center of lateral resistance. There are kind of rules of thumb, but ultimately there are so many variables, it's down to um, experience and a bit of luck. Now this was the, uh, the rig, as it, and this was the only drawing of it I had for the whole conversion. But this is the critical one, and it kind of looks right. It's a big rig, but it's deliberately a big rig because it's for, it's for very light airs. Um, of course, it meant I was going to have to do a lot of re-engineering uh, here to take, the, to take the unstayed mast. Um, here, these, uh, what have been combings above the hatch, this, this of turned into what I call an observation pod. And the idea here was the hatch will be at this level rather than at the, the old um, coach roof level with a hood on top. 
but also this was getting a bit high and I, you know, getting straight up of these ha out of these hatches at sea in a big sea is it's a, it's difficult. It's a little bit dangerous. I'm getting older, so I thought, okay, well, why don't I have a um, a hatch so I can get out into the cockpit? Um, so that was the only drawing. But as we'll see, this gradually evolved as I was building the boat because um, it wasn't a hard and fast plan. It was okay. This is the sort of thing I've got in mind. So I had to find the boat. So here she is down in Nayland in an absolute total mess which is exactly what I wanted. She was just disgusting. She'd been half full of water. Um, just an absolute wreck. But I wanted a wreck because I was going to strip it out and completely rebuild it. So why pay for a nice boat that you're going to destroy? Um, but here, I'll show you this. She was very, very well built. These boats, in fact, I've met the builder, Chris Butler, last year. They built about 600 of them. And uh, he actually won his class in an Ostar in one of these and they are much uh, more strongly built than Coravies. Uh, very, very heavily laid up, despite the still relatively light displacement. So we got it back to burn and then we had to strip off the rotten uh, rail. I then put, although the, the deck to hold joint was okay, I put a couple of extra layers of glass just to beef it up a little bit. Um, then I had the long job of taking off every single um, deck fitting and plugging every hole. Because the boat absolutely leaked like a sieve. Every time it rained, there was you know, 10 gallons of water in, in the bilge. So that was a long job. And then stripping it out uh, inside to start again, taking out a lot of useless stuff, heavy sinks and all that sort of gear. I did leave some, some things to, to use for um, building accommodation and various bits and pieces off. First thing though is to get the key was in a terrible state. Um, it had rusted a bit and got a bit pitted. Uh, and actually although those keel boats are 40 years old, but they went they weren't too bad actually for 40 years, but there's no way I wasn't going to replace them um, and have a look at them. I couldn't have born going to sea without knowing what, what was going on there. Um, now this is where the old uh, silu used to be, and this was ideal because the master was going to go in here. So I was able to use these old beams to beef these up again, and use this half bulkhead uh, to start building the, the mast step, beefing up the hull, getting a very, very strong step in there, and then the, the actual female step uh, to, take the, to take the mast. Then there's the question of, of the deck. Um, now normally if you're beefing up a deck you might do it from underneath but I wanted to do it from on top A because it's a lot easier I felt I could get a be better um, glue lines but more importantly than that I, I could build it up higher because I wanted as much berry as possible for the mast um, so here we've got um, half inch ply then half inch ply on top so now the deck is uh, uh, the, the deck plus an inch of ply and then building it up here and actually, another uh, visual aid, I was very, very pleased when I cut out the, um, the hole for the deck. Um, it was balsa core deck, dry as a bone, no sound, sign of delamination, and already a very substantial deck. Um, you can have a look at that after if you, if you want. But being a belt and braces type, um, we built, then I built a huge flange uh, for the mass, and you can see that it's all... Um, uh, glassed over. Uh, to, I don't use fancy marine pliers. I just use uh, exterior pliers, and as I say, ordinary timber, but then glass it well and pay particular attention to, to end grain. Yeah. And then uh, put extra blocks on the side to take um, uh, the bolts in. So we're already putting on fittings to take uh, harness. I don't actually like jack stays. A lot of boats have jack stays, but this, in my mind, far too much play in a jack stay. I like to have uh, fixed attachments uh, at, fi at predetermined intervals so I can always be anchored two ways um, with, a, with a harness. But as we'll see, I ought not to have to go on deck on this boat um, uh, for, for normal sailing. So then uh, all through bolted here, so very, very strong arrangement here. And uh, I'll talk about the mast in a minute. You also see here that the, uh, the boat had one of these um, uh, fairly useless four hatches 
that was molded it to the same shape of the hull, but it leaked like a sieve. Obviously, no good for seagoing. So we built a built a proper forward hatch there. And as we see later, I mean, this for me this was luxury because Ming Ming had no forward hatch. But the main idea of this hatch, you'll see it opens backwards, was so that I could, um, from the forward hatch, do everything at the base of the mast. Mm. So I don't have to go forward. I just pop my head out the hatch, and I've got perfect. Uh, I can reach the left of the sail, and, and you know, if anything, uh, I can I can do that. Then we start um, with the uh, strengthening and uh, water tight. You may remember there was a bulkhead here, forward, sort of into a, a chain locker, but that I completely sealed, uh, strengthened that. Then a new bulkhead built on top of this little existing bulkhead, all very heavily glassed in, um, all foam filled and then seal. You see there's a very heavy beam here. There's another beam forward of that bulkhead. And that's the hole there through the deck. So it's just a few inches forward. So it gives enormous strength to, the, uh, to that whole part of the, because that's where the main strength, uh, strains are going to be. That's where, that's where the big mast is coming through. And same after, I forgot to take photographs of the bulkhead, but I built another um, watertight bulkhead aft. And then the whole of the aft part of the boat um, sealed. So it's light. Um, there's a nice thing about the Achilles, it had a very long aft, um, a sort of lazarette thing. Uh, so the co cockpit is well in board, but more about the cockpit later. Oh, then we had to get the mast. And I did approach some uh, mast makers, and I just fell about laughing, A, at what they proposed, and B, the prices they proposed. So my um, reply to them was two words. Um, and I bought a lamppost. Uh, and here's the lamppost. It's 40, 45 feet long. Um, How much did it cost, the lamppost? Uh, 700 pounds. Right. Uh, that's 45 foot lamppost, uh, 200 mil at the base, beautifully tapered to 76 mil at the top, three and a half uh, mil walls. Uh, that's about a third of what a, a mass maker would have provided and, and uh, anyway, well, so there my, we are. My mate Ron could have got you one for 100 quid. Oh uh, yeah, it wouldn't have been like this one. <laughs> it, it still had the wires in it though. Yeah, no, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you hit with your lorry, did you? <laughs> anyway, uh, when it arrived, it was very light, 45 feet, but three of us lifted it off the truck. Oh, uh, and then I just made a very rough cut here with a grinder just to um, so that's all the bit that goes in the ground with the door and all the rest of it. And then later, um, made, made a by hand, once I determined the exact length I wanted for the mast, um, uh, an accurate cut. So I brought that bit along because this was very useful. So that's the mast, you can see the mast. That's a pretty substantial bit of um, hole. So you can have a look at that um, if you want. But this was very useful because it meant that I had. I had a, a, a blank I could use for um, testing everything. So there it is, um, fits nicely into the, uh, and then you can just see the, the top there just coming out the, uh, the top. All of the deck fittings have been replaced. You notice I put the, the forward um, uh, cleat, I raised it up, both just put on a big mahogany block A and, and with more backing underneath, A to strengthen it but also I just think it's much easier to use a cleat that's much higher off the deck you can get you can get line around a lot a lot quicker and easier and more line on it if you need to um, so now we're starting to look more like it um, the boat's painted this is a pre coat is it international pre coat things that lovely undercoat that you use and then two coats of that two coat, coats of uh, just ordinary deck paint <coughs> in sort of Ming Ming grey um, However, uh, we then had to approach all this lot, the, the windows. Uh, I didn't like those windows at all, um, uh, not my style. So we had to get them off. They leaked like sieves, get rid of the 40 year old um, uh, sealant, and then replace all that with um, half inch ply, glued and screwed, and, and the port holes. And when I got to this point, when I painted it, oh, I thought at last, now we're starting to look like a good proper sea going boat and you see the um, the u-bolts all the way along for for um, harness uh, attachment so now she's starting yeah, as I say to look uh, to look a little bit more like it and actually once it had all been painted in 
although this was a bit big and baroque, it actually started to look okay. Uh, then we got the keel back on. Uh, that had all been uh, sandblasted, epoxy, glassed and fared. And now we have beautiful stainless steel uh, studs. So that was very reassuring. Uh, meant that we could, I could then paint out the, uh, the bills and we've never had a drop of water in there since. We'll also uh, replace the floors. And back to the kitchen workshop um, for making the cabin sole. Lots of clues and painting it. I love my kitchen workshop. And then, uh, quite by chance, uh, Ming Ming One arrived uh, right next door to Ming Ming Two. So for the first time, I could see them side by side. Now, I deliberately made this porthole exactly the same diameter as Ming Ming One's. The distance is slightly more because it's a slightly bigger boat. But I really wanted to stress the fact that Ming Ming Two is very much a development from, from Ming Ming One. Uh, it's the same, the same lineage. However, what uh, Ming Ming Two has, which Ming Ming One doesn't have, is a port hand bunk. So I was now able to uh, build off the bit of um, uh, joinery I'd, I'd uh, left there to start putting a port bunk. So I have the luxury of a, of a leeward bunk, whatever the weather. Putting in the galley. And that's my idea of a galley. As I said, I've done 20,000 miles on Ming Ming One with that as a galley. Why would you need anything more? It's a lovely little Origo stove. Um, <laughs> quick advert, because they actually gave this to me. Um, I didn't ask them, but somebody else did, quite aggressively. So that, uh, um, they gave it to me. So Origo stoves, I do love them to bits, actually. And the, the big complaint was the smell of meths. But now you use bioethanol. Um, so you don't get any smell either. It's safe, can never go wrong. Um, beautiful. And then, as on Ming Ming Wan, over the, over the stove, the, the chart table, which will hinge up. Then we come on to the um, uh, insulation. And here I figured out, it took me ages and ages of Ming Ming Wan. I was using water-based contact glue. I didn't dare use uh, the other stuff because it's too explosive in a, in a small space. But here I've just used um, industrial contract glue. You buy in packets of you know, the tubes, uh, big boxes of them from B&Q, and then use double-sided carpet tape. The idea being that the, the tape holds the panel into the hole long enough for, then for the glue to go off. So that was much, much quicker <coughs> than the old system. So here's the galley, chart table on top, some insulation, port hand bunk, and this is my fridge. Uh, all I do there is don't insulate the, uh, that bit of the hull in there. So that works great as a, as a fridge, keeps my beer and Chardonnay cool. Or it, it would keep Tony's Chardonnay cool if he were saving it. But I don't take it with me. Uh, then adding shelving there on the port hand. And I was sort of echoing the original style. I had to completely redo the starboard side, but this is sort of the style that it was um, that it was uh, done in. <clears throat> the um, the skeg was a bit of a problem because uh, this had this was originally a galvanised frame for the skeg. Seawater got in, it had rusted, expanded, and um, uh, sort of messed up all of the fiberglass. So I had to redo that, which was um, cleaning it out, epoxying it, clamping it, and then. Um, fiberglassing over. Um, hopefully that will keep the water out from here on or for as long as I need it. <coughs> then we're back to the kitchen workshop and now we're starting on the observation pod as I call it. The idea being here I would have full headroom 360 degree vision from inside the boat without having to open a hatch if necessary. So this is that's the making the forward end uh, this is laminated two pieces of 9 mil ply, and then I use 8 mil polycarbonate for the actual windows. Um, and again, just ordinary exterior ply from Travis Perkins, or oh, B&Q actually, that was from. Uh, that's just sort of setting it up, see how it looks. And then making the blank for the after end. And now it's, it's in position. Instead of using massive timbers again for the, this is the most vulnerable part. Um, and I want it really strong. Um, 
but the, one of the advantages of this, from a seagoing point of view, I calculated it gives me about 500 pounds of flotation. If I'm turned upside down, it makes about very, very unstable inverted, but also it gives a huge writing moment exactly where you want it. So it's not necessarily, it might look a bit ugly, but it serves its purpose in many ways. But it has to be very, very strong. <coughs> and then, <coughs> thanking that, oh, and I had the usual, um, you know, oh, shall I use Douglas fir? Shall I use spruce? What shall I use? Eventually, I went down to Travis Perkins up the road on my bike and just came back with some fiber one, what they call redwood, uh, which is just quite nice pine. But if you're selective, plank's okay. Um, just use that to plank that up. Um, and then just sheath it with four millimeter um, ply, a uh, glued and boat nail, actually, just to really finish it off. <coughs> And then it's all um, fiberglass over. You see, this isn't fiberglass uh, because there's a hatch going there. And exhibit D, if anyone wants to, that's actually the, the top of the observation hatch um, with the unglass bit because that gets cut out eventually. Then uh, had to think about the cockpit. Now, for reasons we'll see later, I extended. Um, Meaning two is con cockpit back from the uh, from the cabin rather than uh, forward from the lazarette. So that's just getting the initial thing set up, just getting the pieces cut out. Uh, nice little bridge deck. I like to have a little bridge deck because then I can have all my cleats for all the all the remote controls for for stuff. See here that it's still still haven't cut out. Uh, this bit, yes. Ah, but we have there. So that was the point of no return. And I took the grinder to this lot and just cut out this bloody big hole all around here uh, and hope for the best. And so, well, y there's no turning back now. Okay. Then, then uh, planking this, planking the, the little side deck, gave me a nice side deck um, on each side here. Again, just using the same old Travis Perkins lumber. <coughs> That's it, more or less completely planked. And it was at this point that my thinking was start to, starting to change um, because I, I'd originally intended that the, the top hatch would be the main work hatch. But as I was building this, uh, A, you'll see that this is at a much steeper angle than the one I had on the original drawing. So I feel it's actually easier to get up out that way than try and get yourself through a, a more vertical door. But as I worked out the ergonomics of it, I realized that actually this hatch would be fabulous as the main working hatch uh, for all sorts of reasons. So that's just trying the uh, apply on there <clears throat> and then cut out for that hatch that's just held there with a uh, clamp at the moment. But you'll see now that all of this has been glassed. So it's all well protected. And, and all very heavily glassed into the hull to give that transverse stiffness. One of the lovely things about Ming Ming Wan was that even in the heaviest weather, she never felt as if she was flexing or moving. Very, very stiff, and that's one of the advantages of small boats, of course. Whether Ming Ming 2 will be like that, I don't know, but this will certainly help, all of this lot. Then cut out the, the, the top hatch, but I'd already started to figure out that that would just be for light and for um, if I wanted to stick my head up or do something on the sail where that gave me better access. You see I've cut out the coach roof as well, but I didn't cut it fully out because this gave a nice little shelf there at the perfect height where I could lean with perfect vision all the way around. Um, and also a shelf I could perhaps put some stuff on use later. So I haven't, of course, cut it out later, but I haven't, haven't done that. Uh, now we're starting to get, and then have to flatten this bit off to take the uh, the Houdini hatch. See, this has now been fared a little bit more. So it's starting to look a bit more like it. Uh, that's the Houdini hatch, uh, not fixed, but in place. And then in the middle of it, it's my birthday. And my son made me this cake. I love it. Isn't that fantastic? He did this all himself, and there's a model of Ming Ming Wan, complete with headsail, complete with insignia. 
looking at great. That gave me a real boost, that did, when I was in the middle of all this hard work. Anyway, now we're starting to look a bit better because we've got some undercoat on. So you may think, why has this not been painted? Well, as I got this far, I suddenly realised that there was the possibility for really protecting that hatch even more. Plus, it would give me a way, um, a much better way of doing the, um, the spray hood. And of course, having the spray hood lower down meant I could have the boom lower down and so on and so forth. I get all kinds of benefits from, from having a, a lower spray hood. And you might wonder why these are built up here, and you'll see in a, in a minute. So that's just a view from the front. Now we've got the windows in, and these frames are just made from uh, nine mil ply uh, again. And the reason this is built up is I can have a little viewing point from inside so I can see forward from if I'm standing up in that hatch I've got vision forward of course I've got fantastic vision forward from all around here but that gave me an extra uh, little one so there's the whole thing finished and uh, it is amazing from that hatch I, I've got access to uh, all the controls uh, main halyard and so on and so forth which is the main one then I had to build the hood so again as per Ming Ming one just a bit of copper tubing um, cost about five quid to do that um, and then hand sewed um, the spray hood same as Ming Ming one so this is giving a very nice little hatch very sheltered um, I've got vision forward here if necessary you'll notice this is a Lumar hatch and that's because I need that's the final exit hatch if say I had to go on deck to launch a drogue in bad weather I need a hatch that I can close from the outside and the Houdini hatches don't have exterior dogs on them, but the Lumar hatch does, so I can, I can close that watertight if I'm on deck in, in bad weather. That's why it's the Lumar hatch. It's also actually a much more substantial hatch, and a much heavier hatch, and a much more expensive hatch. But it's a good hatch. Now, you see now why I didn't um, extend the cockpit forward, was that the Achilles has this, cock has this outboard well in the cockpit. And this boat came with the proper seagoing plug and the proper outgoing plug. And I had this idea in the back of my mind, well, I might possibly um, have a little uh, torpedo electric outboard just for getting in and out of harbours and what have you. So I might do that, but the boat is so handy and sails so well that as yet I haven't felt any urgency to do it. Um, <clears throat> another important thing, though, was to seal the cockpit lockers they had nice baffles and all the rest of it, but I wouldn't consider that seaworthy. So they, that was all sealed, and by that time, um, we've now got a completely watertight boat. However, uh, rudders, now these rudders uh, and rudder stocks are 40 years old, and on the Achilles, they're starting to fail, because they're just made with stainless tube, and particularly at the waterline, um, they're starting to go. People are having their rudders drop off. Well, that didn't sound like a good idea. So, with the good <coughs> help of my friend uh, Vic Stacey at the back, uh, <coughs> we started work on a new rudder. Um, and instead of using stainless tube, this is solid 25mm stainless bar. So that ain't going to break. And instead of using single tangs, we use double tangs. And then Victor made the, uh, uh, the rudder. Well, it's just to save me time, because I was desperate by that time to get the boat in the water. So there we end up with the new rudder, uh, the refurbished skeg uh, and I also just put a little um, had welded on a little right angle to the bottom of the um, the rudder shoe I think the the shoe was fine um, but this is quite heavy and I just wanted to beef that up a little bit for peace of mind uh, then the tiller now uh, this is an off-the-shelf Lumar fitting very belt and braces it has three different ways of fixing it to the top of the rudder stop so it's not going to go anywhere um, <coughs> built the new tiller now you see the tiller's long and this is quite awkward when you're sailing um, it kind of gets in the way but or sailing using the cockpit but the idea is I can reach everything very very easily from from the cockpit um, and also work on the principle I could always make it shorter if I wanted to um, but it's harder to make it longer Back to the mast, I designed this masthead fitting and just up the road there's, an, there's a guy in Southminster, the next village, who does agricultural welding and he does stainless. So um, he welded that up for me. Um, I won't go into too much 
detail because we're running out of time. Uh, the mast I then had to protect from the weather, so um, I put, it's got nine coats of epoxy paint on it, so it's very well protected. Uh, then we come to making the spars. Uh, now, the boom on a junk rig doesn't have to be particularly strong. And again, the same thing, what shall I make it of? Spruce, dug for Travis Perkins, uh, cheapo pine, um, just laminated to stabilize it and make it stronger. That's making the yard and then putting on the yard sling. And interestingly, practical junk rig, which is Blondie Hazard's Bible on this stuff, has a throwaway remark. It's a, it just says, uh, for the yard sling, a metal sling is better than a rope sling. Didn't say why, and I couldn't figure out why. Um, it was a damn sight easier to make a rope one, and it saved putting big screws or bolts right through the yard. So far, it's been fine, so we'll see, it, see how it goes. Uh, very powerful sail, which I'll come on to later. Mm. So I needed strong battens. So these are fiberglass. I needed four meters, but they only, uh, the standard lengths are two and a half meters. So I had to sleeve them and, and extend them. So they're the, the five battens. That's the bigger one, because that's the top batten for storm, uh, storm work. And then back to the um, uh, mass base. You need a bolt for the Bonneville junk rig mass. A to stop it lifting, and B to stop it revolving. So I had to sort that out. And uh, then just cutting out the bits for the must boot, which is just hand sewn. So we've got everything except the sail. But fortunately, I had already made the sail, because this was uh, the, the, the previous winter. This is taking us more or less to the end of August of last year. But I made the sail in London, in the London flat, between Christmas and New Year. So here we are. And why well, didn't make it myself? Well, I like doing things myself. Um, but could you imagine going to a sail maker and saying, OK, I want you to make this junk rig sail. And I want it to be cambered. And it's going to have these hinges in it, which is like a piano hinge. Um, and I want this and I want that. And they say, you know, I mean, it was just a hopeless um, proposition. So I made it myself, turned the dining room into a sail loft for a week, 10 days. The floor of Brenda's study was just um, wide enough to take a complete panel. It's one of the, the top top panels there. So I was in and out all the time saying, do you mind if I just... Uh, um, now this sail is a bit revolutionary. The idea of cambered junk sails is not revolutionary, but um, A, I couldn't, I couldn't have coped with the full sail the sail is 280 square feet, it's a big sail. I couldn't have coped with it in the flat to lay it out to get it through the machine. So there's that side, so that the, the top four panels are joined, but the bottom three panels are all separate. Imagine going to the sail maker. I want to make this junk rig sail, but it's actually going to be in four bits. Um, and the bottom panels are use these, what I call hinges, um, which alternate and then the batten goes through these hinges. I like the idea of having panels I could just take off very easily. I like the idea of having a sail where if I wanted to change the draft of the sail, I just need to alter these hinges rather than unpicking, unpicking a whole sail and starting again. Uh, this is the bottom panel, so this is where it attaches to the boom. And you can see that there is a, an aerodynamic shape built in here, and the same on these panels that the the shape is built into the hinges, but the actual panels themselves are flat. But the top, the top part is conventional, and then there that's just broad seamed, so you can see that the, the draft is built in the sail, but these edges are eventually uh, joined to give the draft in the top. Uh, that's putting it, the sail is, has two inch uh, uh, webbing all the way around, leech, um, luff, uh, top and bottom. And these are putting on the tabs to take the, uh, the sheets. And of course, I could do everything triple seamed as I wanted. Uh, that's one of the upper batten pockets, which is the more conventional <coughs> backing pockets. Yeah, and that's uh, progressing. That's Sailmaker at work. And of course, we had to have Ming Ming's insignia uh, on there. The sun and the moon. I haven't got time to go into all of that for you, as you who don't know, but anyway. 
So the, the sale had actually been made six months before, but I'd never been able to lay it out on the lawn because the lawn had been too wet for the whole of that six months. So finally, I laid it out. And you can see now how these hinges work. The, the, the battens go through these hinges. So there she was laid out on the lawn and a jolly fine looking sale it was. And a, a very, very big sale. You see there's a slight scallop in the leeches here to stop uh, fluttering. So then we had to get the mast uh, out of the garden. So there you are with uh, Victor and Richard down the high street. <laughs> and uh, there we go. Um, notice I plugged the bottom of the mast by that, by that time. And then dress the mast and uh, get the mast boot on. And then Ian from Rice and Coal with his wizardry slung the mast onto a um, front end loader and bang, we had it rigged. <coughs> So this was a big moment because I had, well you can see the mast over here, I had been a little bit worried that it might be out of a little bit too big for the boat, but actually because it's got a nice taper on it, it didn't look too bad. And I think that um, because I've got all this Baroque stuff around here, it kind of leads the eye up into the mast uh, more easily than if it was just a, just came straight through the deck, it might look a little bit too much there, but um, I thought that looked okay-ish. And then we got the sail on and hoisted it a few times. Um, and then finally um, got some anti fouling on. We're now getting to the end of, of August or beginning of September and I desperately, the boat was by no means finished inside, but I desperately had to get it sailing because I had no idea how all of these alterations were going to affect the trim of the boat. Because I'd moved the mast forward, quite a heavy mast. And I'd, you know, built stuff in, but then on the other hand, there was more weight further out. How is it going to all work out? And I needed to know this before I built the in the final internal joinery to take the heavy stones. <coughs> so I really needed to see a how it trimmed and b how she sailed. So on the wettest day imaginable, uh, we took her down. Say only two thirds finished inside. Which is up as the nice olive Lee hull as you'll see, and stuck her in the water. Um, and this is a you know, scary moment. As you'll see, she trimmed very nicely, probably maybe half an inch down by the head, but nothing you'd really notice. And she sat absolutely beautifully in the water. And even Michael, the foreman at Rice and Coal, who is not a man to impress easily, easily said, Quora, don't she float well? <laughs> yeah, thanks, man. That was the best compliment I'd ever had. So, um, then it's time to go sailing. Now, you see here how these hinges work. Yeah, there are holes in the sails, but it doesn't seem to make much difference. And in fact, I've had an email from somebody um, the other day, a junk rig sailor, who, who reckons it might actually help um, because it stops the sails stalling. Well, who knows? I don't think anybody really understands the aerodynamics of a junk rig sail. Um, and you can see there how the, uh, the draft decreases as we go up. There is draft in these upper panels, uh, but not a lot, because these are the storm panels. But now as we come down, it gets, it gets uh, uh, more and more. As we'll see after the break, Dick Durham uh, came from Yachting Monthly came uh, sailing, and he seemed to enjoy it. And uh, there were going on very nicely. Now, uh, um, after, after the break, I'm going to show you some videos of the boat sailing, both from on the boat, and then Yachting Monthly came along, and I'm going to show you, you're going to have a world premiere, because <laughs> they have taken a video, uh, you know, from around the boat, um, which was great for me, because, you know, you never get to see your own boat sailing from a distance when you're single-handed sailing. Yeah. Um, so I've got film of that and a bit of an interview, and that will be going on to Yachting Monthly website um, uh, probably in about a week's time when the next edition comes out, because they've done an article on, on uh, Ming Ming Tu. We've got two minutes before the lunch break, so I can take one question, if anybody's got a burning question. Yes, Duncan. Um, with your new sale, yes. You'll see that after the break. Very well indeed. It's always the eternal question. It's the eternal <laughs> question. No, it's fantastic. Um, it's the, well, you'll see. 
Um, you know, who am I to say? I'm very, very pleased with the way it goes to windward, and I'm very, very pleased with the with the um, performance of the sail. The insulation that you, sh you sh uh, sent around here, the insulation in two parts. One is a carpet, and what is the rubber compound or? Plastic? Yeah, yeah, it's called plaster. So it's yeah, that's the foam. Ah. Yeah, so the foam goes on first. The carpet is just because I live in a padded cell basically so <laughs> and that that's just for the carpet is more for aesthetic sense rather than just having black foam um, but it helps okay yeah. you don't sound convinced about it no no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm interested because i want yeah no it works fine one more question okay. yes did the uh, uh that post come from Holland? Originally, yeah, they make them uh, yeah. sappers in, in Holland, but it, but it actually came from, from Wales. Uh, the Aluminium Lighting Company in, in Swansea. Yeah. Uh, well, I tried to get them, and I could only get them if they were delivered from, direct from Holland from the, <coughs> from, the, uh, from the factory. Oh, well, try the Aluminium Lighting Company. Yeah. Do, do, have you tried them? Thing. I went through trying to get lamp posts and everything. Uh, and did you try them? Because this was only last four years ago, I suppose. Oh no, well, try, try them. Okay. And actually, they're very in they said it's the first time one of their masks has been used, one of their lampers has been used as a mask. And they want a, they want a progress report. Well, I ended up going to Hayley Island. I was surprised at their prices and went over and made it. They wanted nine hundred pound for a mask, so I came home and made two for three hundred pound each. Yeah. Yeah, I mean ideally I would have liked to make my own timber mask, but it's a time and weight and all the rest oh, of it. Anyway, the that's anyway, that's a pretty good hunk of aluminium. Okay, so um, we're gonna have a break for forty five minutes and then I've got some videos and more questions after after the after the break. Thank you very much.